There we go. Welcome to everyone watching the replay. I'm about to start our panel and let's see if uh, everyone is in fact here. I believe so. For anyone joining us, uh, let us know that you can hear us and see us. Raj, thank you, first comment. Uh, give a little chat right in that bottom right corner. Say hello, if you're comfortable with it, say where you're joining us from. Hi, Ivash. Um, I know it takes a little bit of time to get used to this format, so go ahead, take your time. We're gonna leave a couple more minutes before we really get started. So you're not missing anything by figuring out where to type. Hi, Mags. If you are on a phone, and I believe some tablets, you might have to click, you might have to tap a little chat icon along the bottom. If you're on a computer, it's that bottom right corner there. I see some other people typing. Hi, Marge. Newcastle, Arizona. Hi, Dorothy. It's pretty neat wow, seeing people join from all you. over. Can we talk too? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, guys. Right now we're just, we're welcoming everyone into the room. So just be comfortable. Yeah. Everyone's welcome here. Hi, Kevin. Man Mandara. Mandara in Western Australia. Yes. Oh, wow. Idaho. All right. Hi, Magic Tuna. Hello, hello. Nice to see you. Some nice familiar faces or names. Welcome. Indeed. All right, I think, why don't we get started? I imagine there will be more people uh, trickling in throughout the whole event. Uh, Leslie, hi, Leslie. Um, hey, Leslie. Keep saying hi. So before we get started, I want to thank everyone who's already been chatting, uh, saying hi. While the teachers are presenting, I wanna welcome you guys to give them encouragement. Uh, when we are presenting, we're just looking into a webcam. It's hard to know that there are real people out there. Your chats really comfort us. They let us know that you're out there, that you're listening, and we really appreciate it. And for teachers, I wanna welcome you. Feel free to ask questions to the attendees. Even though you can't see them, they're here. So ask them questions. And um, if we get questions from the attendees, feel free to answer them if you see the chats or at the end of when you're finished speaking, I'll look through them and I'll present a couple to you as well. How does that sound? All right, so I think now is the time I get to introduce who we have here. I imagine most of the people here already know some, maybe all of you. Uh, let's start with um, Graham Tufnell, who will be speaking first. He is a teacher, web developer, I'm pretty sure he is the person who made the very first web-based uh, web bridge engine. Is that is that right, Graham? Well, I think I'd be close. I think I'd be. You're in the running. We, we'd have in to go in the. Uh, um, uh, along with uh, Tina McVeigh, Graham co-founded the House of Cars in Christchurch, New Zealand, and he also uh, made the very popular Sky Bridge Club. And I imagine there's quite a few of you here from that. Uh, he teaches regularly in Christchurch, and he also teaches a weekly class here at LearnBridge Online. Kirsten Hartley, we're so happy to welcome you to LBO. Uh, Kirsten Hartley is a bridge teacher, a businesswoman, and an entrepreneur. Uh, bridge runs in her blood, literally. She comes from very uh, distinguished lineage in terms of bridge. Uh, Kirsten, am I right? Your grandfather and your father wrote bridge columns? Yes, in, they wrote bridge columns for the Times in London, a long time ago now. <laughs> and here you go, you're continuing the legacy. Someone's well, going to do it. <laughs> well, we are so happy to have you here with us. And of, course Joan, and of course, Joan Butts, who um, I imagine most all of you know, Joan Butts is just a legend. Uh, she is training teachers throughout Australia. She has an incredible website, joanbuttsbridge.com which just has a inspiring library of videos and resources for learning. Joan, what do you think? You've taught thousands of people how to play? I, who could count? I don't know. We're so happy um, to have you here on the panel. Thank, thank you. you, Joan. It's lovely to be here. So why don't we jump right in? Graham's gonna talk first, leave your comments, leave your questions, and then we'll just take it from there, shall we? 
All right, I'm going to turn it over to Graham right now. Leslie, you said that um, Kirsten is upside down. I think that's just because she's in Australia, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not sure. She looks okay from here. Okay, hi, everybody. So we're talking about um, mistakes and how to recognize your mistakes and maybe learn from them. But I thought it would be helpful to just think about what what is actually a mistake in the first place. And we have to recognize that we're all different and we all play bridge for different reasons and we all have different styles of playing. Some of you will, um, someone you will like the carefully crafted auction with each bid carrying a special message to your partner. And by following all the rules and learning um, lots of different situations to cover every bidding situation, then you will uh, hope to get to the right contract. And that's that's a um, perfectly valid, normal, and respectable way to play bridge. It's, it's, um, you know, it's really great having that communication thing going on. Some of you will, and you know who you are, you'll rely more on your intuition you will um maybe you just have a hunch you pass when maybe everyone else is bidding you maybe you bid when everyone else is passing you you double because you have a hunch and while some people might think that's sort of a kind of airy fairy way of playing i don't think it's airy fairy at all it takes uh takes a lot of practice and confidence to play with intuition and it's a skill that can be developed. So any approach to playing bridge is valid but depending on how you play then that's going to determine to you what you think is a mistake. So I thought we'd look at a couple of hands. I think you can see this hand on the screen here and I'll try and I'll try and See if I can explain what I mean here. So just look at the south, north and south cards. I hope, can everyone see those cards on the screen there? Let me know if you can see all of that. I hope you can. South's got uh, ace, nine, seven, six, five of spades. So south's the bottom hand, north's the top. So you're south and north is your partner and there's east and west. Okay. Now, just imagine that you are, you're sitting south and your partner's north and you are in a contract of four spades. Okay, your contract is four spades. Don't worry about the bidding. Don't worry about how you got to four spades. Just think, okay, I'm in a contract of four spades. Am I going to make this contract? So take your time. Just have a look through the... Um, look, at the, look at all four hands. You're allowed to peek at east and west and see if you can make four spades. What you can do, if it seems uh, there's a lot of cards to take in, just look at each suit individually. Look at the hearts and look at the diamonds. See how many clubs you would expect to lose. Think how you would play the spade suit. And let me know. You think, let me know if you think you might make a contract of four spades or you'd be struggling with it. I know it's uh, not normal. <laughs> it's not normal that you can see the opposition's cards, I know, when you're bidding, but we'll, we'll just play a special game here. Absolutely make, says Leslie. Yep. Yeah. Four hearts, four spades, three hearts, and three diamonds. Yep. So another way of looking at it is what tricks you would lose. So lose a spade, says Ivosh. Yep, and two clubs. So four spades looks like that's a pretty good contract. Let me change things slightly 
and I'm going to just tweak cards a little bit. Now your hand and your partner's hand this time are exactly the same. Right? You've got exactly the same 19 points that you had last time and your partner's got exactly the same six points that he or she had last time. So is four spades going to make now? Is four spades a good contract this time? And again, we look at the east-west hands and we see, well, let's take a look. We're going to lose two clubs. All right, just look at that club suit. We're missing the ace-king of clubs, and there's absolutely nothing we can do about those two cards. Whatever happens, there's no way to avoid losing two clubs. Now let's look at the spade suit. How many spades will you lose on this hand? Is there any way you can avoid losing two spades? And there's not. There's the, you're missing the king, queen, jack, and they're all on one hand. So you're going to lose two clubs and two spades. So there's no way you can make this for spade contract. So, okay, let's stop for a second and think. On the first hand, first, first one, the spades broke two in each hand. And on the second one, the spades were three in one hand and two in the other hand. Now, I'm not going to get heavily into the maths and all the percentages and what have you, but let's just go approximately. About half the time, more or less, Half the time you're going to make the contract and half the time you're not going to make the contract, approximately. Now, let me give you the third and final hand. This time, I've started the option for you. So south has been one speed. North is with two spades, that's normal, but you don't know whether you can't see the east and west cards this time. So you don't know whether they're three in one hand and one in the other, or two in, one, two in each hand. So what should you do? Should you bid four spades or should you leave it in two spades? More importantly, and here's the question I really want you to think about. If you bid, if you bid four spades, if you bid four spades, would that be a mistake? Would it be a mistake to bid four spades? Tell me what you think. Would it be a mistake to bid four spades? We can't see the east and west cards this time. Okay, we've got, a, we've got some yeses and we've got some noes. <laughs> okay, it's close, isn't it? But would it be, we don't know whether we're going to make the contract, but would it be a mistake to bid for spades? I think those two questions are a little bit, they're different. common way of looking at this sort of situation at the table, and this is where we come back to thinking about mistakes. Very common way of thinking about this is, you've been in this situation before many times, I know you have, and you, let's say you choose to bid four spades, and that four spade contract makes, and you think, oh, that's really great, I made my four spade contract, we bid really well. Awesome. On another time, another situation, that four spade contract will go down and you'll think, ah, no, 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 we shouldn't have bid four spades. We shouldn't have bid four spades because it went down. Why did partner, you know, partner shouldn't have bid two spades on that hand because it's too balanced. So what's happening there is that you're using the result 
to determine whether or not you made a mistake. And I think for, for most players, this is the number one issue we have to deal with. The result of a hand doesn't tell you whether or not you made a mistake. Here's how I would think about it. We've got 25 points between the two hands. With 25 points between the two hands, I think it would be a mistake not to bid four spades. And being very simple soul, I've got a very simple method for telling, for deciding whether or not I've made a mistake. And it's this. It's, this is nothing new to you. This is just my, basically my entire bidding system. It's my mistake finder. If my partner and I have got less than 25 points, it would be a mistake, I think, to bid game, regardless of whether or not game makes. I'm not interested in the final result. I only want to look at the strength of the combined hands. If we've got 25 points between the two hands, it would be a mistake not to bid game. And 33 points, I'm going to bid a slam. If I've got less than 33 points, it would be a mistake to bid a slam, regardless of whether or not that contract makes or not. Now you can tweak things, you know, with slam, of course, you know, if you've got 30 points and a great trump fit, sure. But um, it's, it's uh, the combined strength of the hand that tells you whether you've made a mistake rather than the final result. Okay, let me finish by giving you a hand. And uh, here we go. You are sitting in the south seat. And let's count up our points there. We've got uh, 10, 11, 7, 11, what is that? 10, 17, 18 high card points. So regardless of what system you play, that's too strong for one no trump. So I'll open one club, one spade, two clubs, and we get a pass. Now what? What should we do? Now, what would you all do? Three no trumps from Raj, nice. Two no trumps from Ivosh, okay, good. Anyone else, anyone doesn't like the hand, anyone pass? Two no trumps from Liz, two no trumps from Caroline. Good, nice mix of hands there. Anyone not like the hand at all and pass? Be reasonable. Anyone want to bid three clubs or five clubs? Let's face it, this, um, this could, this hand could go badly wrong, whatever we do. It's possible that we could lose a whole bunch of spade tricks. So I don't know if the con, I don't know what contract's going to make, but I have to make a guess. So my guess is going to be based upon for me, it's going to be very simple. It's going to be this. Have I got 25 points between the two hands? If I think I do, then I'm going to bid game. So I've got uh, 10, 18, partner's got six, to nine, hopefully not six. You didn't have to bid two clubs. So I think we've got 25 points. So I'm going to bid three no trumps. Is that a mistake? Not for me, because it doesn't matter to me whether the contract makes or not. I've got 25 points. Six of spades, uh oh. Now, was it a mistake to bid three no trumps now? Now was it a mistake? 
What do we think? Is this contract going to make or not? No, we still don't know. What do you think? Is three no trumps? We're going to be okay here, or we're going down. Five clubs from Raj. Nine tricks are there. Well, let's see. If West has led the six of spades, suppose let's suppose that. Uh, Let's just guess and say that West started with ace-jack, fifth of spades, and East started with king doubleton. What's going to happen now? Okay, so West started with, let's say, ace-jack, um, ace-jack, nine, six, two, and East has got the king and the eight. As you can see what's going to happen now, East is going to win the king and return a spade, and we're going to lose the first five spade tricks. On the other hand, if West has got the ace king of spades and East has got the jack of spades, or, or, or no big spades, then we're going to make the contract. Here's the thing. Was it a mistake for me to bid three no trumps? Was that three no trump bit a mistake now? What do you think? Is three no trumps a mistake? Hmm. Well, for me, three no trumps was not a mistake. And it doesn't matter whether the contract is going to make or not. For me, I've got 25 points between the two hands, so I'm going to bid three no trumps. Like Leslie says, we've got the points, so we cross our fingers and we bid three no trumps, and there you go. So keep your mistakes simple and don't worry about your mistakes. <laughs> you know, have play a simple system, don't worry about mistakes, and enjoy your bridge. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. And thank you, everyone, for leaving comments and questions. So, Graham, a follow-up question that I have for you, um, especially the immediacy playing online where you can so quickly see so many other people who played the same hand. And as a learner, maybe a perpetual learner myself, there's a lot of people playing who have a lot more experience than I do. And some leave really um, helpful, long explanations of why they decided to bid up to slam or why they didn't. And it just goes over my head. But it's still enough to make me question, wait, did I, I, I must not have understood my bait, you know, I, I, I missed something or there was something I didn't understand. Should I worry about, like, what can I take from that experience? So even if I'm not looking at the results, what about when I read someone else's comment and it, it's still too much for me to understand immediately? I understand. So a couple of things. First of all, when you're playing online especially, you get a lot of results. You're always going to see a large number of scores. And when there's a lot of scores, there's always going to be some outliers. There's always going to be someone who does something crazy and someone's going to get a good score from doing something on the edge. You know, if you get if you get a hundred people doing something crazy, one of them's gonna hit the jackpot. <laughs> okay. So it's important not again, it's important not to let the results determine whether or not you think you've done well or not. One of the things that we see all the time is people have a perfectly reasonable contract, get a perfectly reasonable score, but not get the top score. And that can be upsetting because you think, I, I must have been able to do something better. I didn't get the top score. 
But you can't let those outlier scores bug you. And if you stick to the general principles I'm talking about, if you've got 25 points, game. If you've got 33 points, land. Secondly, as I, this is the confession time, <laughs> let me turn the recording off. I don't want this. I don't want this. <laughs> but you know, as a teacher, and I'm I'm playing online here, and I've I've just bid to a good slam, and I think I've I bid it really well, and I've made my six spades. So I'm as a teacher, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to write a really good explanation of why I bid six spades because it's helpful after I've been made six spades. Okay. If I bid a really good hand and I've gone down on my six spades contract, I'm unlikely to get a really good well, I'm not going to write a really good explanation about it. So the people who are giving you the helpful advice, which is great, and it's a, I encourage everyone to do that and read it, just bear in mind that all those things are post-hand. You're always looking at the end result. And that's, that's where we can be better off, better threat. Mm. that make sense? It is, yeah, it's helpful. Thank you, Graham. Um, for any of the uh, viewers, if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat. Uh, maybe we'll uh, return to those at the end. Uh, Kirsten or Joan, any questions for Graham or responses to what he said? No, I think I, I largely agree. Sorry, Joan, you go. You go, first one. You go. Okay. Um, Graham, thank you so much uh, for raising all those points. Um, I have a lot of agreement with you throughout all you were saying and I'll be talking a little bit about that myself when when it's my turn but uh, thank you for your points yes I, I agree with a lot of it <laughs> oh without further ado why don't we uh, jump in I will um, swing the spotlight over to Kirsten and am Joan I, Graham I, and I am I still, uh, am I, still upside down? <laughs> <laughs> I think someone must have been holding their computer upside down I hope <laughs> You look great to us. You look All great. Right. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I don't have um, any hands to show you, but what I did think that I would talk a little bit about was um, the type of class I'm used to working with, which is for beginners and, and rank beginners. We, we talk about holding cards to start with. Uh, so we, we are looking at the very basics of, of a wonderful, wonderful game. And um, I think what Graham's touched on was very much what we deal with in classes. Uh, we want to make our classes a safe environment for, for learning. And equally, when we're playing, when we're playing with, with our partner in a partnership game, we want to have a safe environment for us to communicate as partners. And uh, that's all part of the uh, STEAM method of um, creating safe places to learn, which, um, thank you, Joan, I'm sure you'll be talking a little bit about that in a little while. Um, it's important, I think, to, as Graham says, have a really good attitude towards what you consider to be a mistake and what is just a learning process. Um, Mistakes can take many forms, and, and there are the outright mistakes that we're all very familiar with, particularly improving players and uh, beginners and coaching beginners to understand the technical side of bidding, um, as opposed to the art of judgment, what is a good hand. And I know that Graham's made some videos where he's um, been talking about not opening a hand. It, it might have the points. Technically, it qualifies to be an opening hand, but it doesn't necessarily have what it takes to be an opening hand. And this is where communication with your partner needs to be so spot on. So um, really looking at where you're communicating a good hand and a good bid. And you understand and you're, you're saying things to your partner, but you're also presenting your hand in the bidding um, 
in the best possible way. So um, if you have a, um, an attitude of, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, you know, this is going to be a really great hand, we're going to go to four spades, for example, um, that's fine. But to have a, a, the difference between a, a finite game and an infinite game, um, I don't know if anybody's been reading Simon Sinek, but um, you, you're looking at the attitude of saying, I just want to learn more and to do better than I did before, just so that I can take on board the things that I'm learning and apply them so that my game is consistently and constantly improving. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be winning all the congresses and the tournaments, but uh, it means that your game is consistent and consistently improving and your communication with partners also consistently improving. Um, if you're looking at um, when we're looking at uh, winners and losers in class, um, it's very difficult for beginners to, to grasp these concepts that um, they want to win every single hand and, and each ace has to be a winner and sometimes they just aren't um, and that may be because of a mistake or maybe a miscalculation or it, it may be that just need to feel safe about playing a hand consistently and consistently well and learning along the way. Um, it's all about building confidence. I mean, you, you go into bridge clubs and people say, well, it was always my partner's fault. <laughs> And that's the wonderful thing about having a partner. It is always their fault, not. Um, and uh, when, it, when it does go wrong, I think it's important to um, take it on board and own it. You know, if, you, if, if something didn't go right, well, instead of giving your partner and giving into the temptation to give your partner or whoever it was an instant bridge lesson over the, over the, across the table after the hand, um, it's very important for, to make them feel safe in the partnership. And if something goes wrong or, on the other hand, if the opposition play a defence particularly well, it's important to just say, well, that was, that was an interesting hand and go over it later. You know, don't, don't go across the table with, um, with bridge lessons. So um, in terms of um, building confidence, building consistency, um, using your, your uh, bidding play, uh, your bidding to, to really communicate solid hands. Don't be afraid to pass if you're not completely sure that your opening hand in points is going to communicate something that's actually there. Um, for your partner to to go with, um, there's nothing wrong if you're if you if you've got um, two kings, two queens, a jack, and a bit of a length point. You you, you don't have to open. <laughs> you really don't. Um, just pass and wait. See what comes through the bidding on the other side. Um, partner might have something, in which case you can come in later on with a really good backup or an overcall. It's. Um, it's, I think, uh, a little bit finite and boxy to say that there are obviously mistakes in, in understanding, but um, to say that everything that goes wrong is necessarily a mistake. There are lots of things to learn from, and it's, it's part of the process. So in terms of what we do with uh, our beginners, we try and make it as fun as possible, even when things go down, we, we try and make that a, a, as much of a fun and learning experience as we can so that they, they, um, the next game that comes along, they've learned from that experience. They're applying their knowledge, they're practicing and uh, they're recognizing when things happen again or when things happen across the table with the opposition in play. Um, it's very important to keep a really strong, positive attitude and um, not everything is mistake ridden. <laughs> it may seem so sometimes. It may seem that um, the bidding's gone wrong or the, or the play's gone wrong or you've budgeted wrongly for your, for your losers or, or whatever it is, but um, it, it's important to move through that and keep going. Thank you so much, Kirsten. I wanna welcome Graham and Joan for any uh, follow-up or um, questions. 
Uh, Desert Door asked a good question. Is the communicating between partners mainly referring to duplicate play? When you, in, um, what you the communication in, in bidding, I'm not sure that I'm completely over the question. When you're when you're communi communicating a, um, uh, if you have an opening bid and partner responds um, just raising, for example, as opposed to changing suit, there are different examples that you can use. So I think uh, Graham's example where just previously where the opening bid was one club and there was a two club raise. Um, there were opportunities to say different things there, which communicated different different um, responses. So uh, a change of suit rather than just raise, communicate something, um, a, a single raise as, as opposed to a jump raise. Uh, there are different ways of communicating what exactly your hand looks like. I'd like to hop in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Graham. When, when um, with duplicate play, let's just be sure. Duplicate play uh, means everybody's playing with the same card. So, so if you're south, you pass the hand on. You're so the next south is playing with the same hands. Now that's different to say rubber bridge, where you just shuffle the cards up every time, and. Um, I've, I've played a lot of duplicate and a lot of rubber bridge, and you're still bidding. You're still using whatever system you might use. But the fact is that if you're playing rubber bridge, you're going to be playing a few hands with your partner, then you're going to shift to playing with another partner. And you don't have time to develop the little subtleties that a regular duplicate partnership would perhaps develop. So it's, 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 it's the fact that we, it's, it's still the same game and you're still communicating. It's just that with Rubber Bridge, you've got less time to be subtle, that's all. I have a follow-up question uh, for Kirsten. Um, so talking about the learning the technical versus developing judgment. How, yeah. um, when we're thinking about how to communicate with our partners, how do we talk about that? Like, how, how, you know, how should I say, you know, I think we're being a little too technical right now. Or would I ever say, I understand why you did that, but, you know, maybe the judgment, <laughs> maybe, maybe there was some extra factors and we should free ourselves up to not just stick by the hard rules. Is there, how would you recommend we talk to partner about that? Um, there were that my partner and I usually do that over a nice cup of coffee afterwards. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it is very much a, a conversation that needs to be ongoing. If you have a regular partner, and I actually play in different clubs and have different partners, so I have conversations quite consistently um, about how how a communication might have gone wrong um and we discuss it and we say well look how do we get over this and so we come to an agreement as to to how we're going to um look at a, a, a particularly um difficult hand at the, the the opening where you're not quite there i think that the thing that's most difficult for a lot of beginners to come to grips with is I've got 12, 13 points, but I really just don't like this hand. Um, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to, it's something that's developed is understanding the judgment. Um, so if you have a, you know, a hand that's just not full of, of, um, of qualities that you would really like to put to your partner as an opening hand, um, there's nothing wrong in, in just saying, no, I don't, don't like that one. I'm going to pass on that, that opening and see what the rest of the bidding is, is going to take on and, and how it takes. Whether that's, that's, a, that's a conversation to have with partners to say, look, I have 12 points here. Um, it included a length point, but um, I, it just wasn't something I wanted to put forward to you. 
um, on that particular hand. Let's have another look at it. You can you can have a look at the um, the hand again if you if you're in duplicate and you can get the print out afterwards and have a look at the hand and look at it again together and say well how can we better communicate something like that when when it's um, not quite there. It's like opening if if you have eleven points and you're in first seat and you you've got eleven points. You've got 11 points. It's not an opening hand, so pass. You, know, you don't have to push it. Um, but then again, um, it's, it's, it is a, a conversation you need to have with partner. When you're playing online, of course, your partner's a robot, and they're going to, you're going to have a consistency of, of response for whatever you do. And maybe there's a chance there for people, when they're playing online, to, to push it a little harder and see how far they go, up or down. But um, when you're playing with a with a real life person, those are real life conversations you need to have. Oh, thank you, Kirsten. Why don't we uh, welcome Joan up? Joan, can I turn the mic over to you? Yeah, hi there. How are you, everybody? Um, I'm just reading an interesting question, which said, or a comment: Anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. And I love that. And I'm sorry, guys, but I don't have any hands for you today. But I think I'd like to talk generally about teaching bridge. And I think that if we could possibly help people to be able to make mistakes and not to be horribly embarrassed when they think they've made a mistake, because the truth is you will never learn anything unless you make a mistake at it before you perfect it. It's just part of life. You try something new, you fail at it, you fail at it again, you keep trying and eventually you perfect it. And our attitude to teaching really should be that people shouldn't be frightened of making mistakes. I certainly was the way I was taught and that's why I'm so keen to be involved with teaching so that people can say, okay, I tried this and it didn't work. And if you can show people that there is a logic to the game and if they've got a reason for what they're doing, even if it's a mistake or not, I mean, what is a mistake? A mistake in a way is in the, the, in the eye of the beholder. So I think... Kirsten's mentioned what we um, concentrate on in training people and training teachers, and that is that the safety of the students and the security of the students is vital so that they feel that maybe, oh, okay, I'm trying this. If it didn't work, nobody's going to tell me I'm stupid. Um, so that's one point that I would like to say about mistakes. The other thing is that if we realise that experts sit around for hours discussing, is this hand an opening hand? Would you open? Why would you open? Why would you not open? That the bidding is a huge area for discussion. So to say this is right and this is wrong is a really bad way to introduce bridge to people. It's much more important to say, is this how you felt about the hand, what was it that made you want to open this hand? What's good about the hand? What's bad about the hand? Um, so we sort of minimise the word, certainly mistakes, at the bridge table. And the other thing I'd like to comment on is that having a good partner is very important as to whether what you do is a mistake or not. And having a partner who, when you've tried something new, they'll say to you at the end of a hand when it didn't work, why did you do that? Well, you know, they're not really asking why. They're actually trying to get their little bit in and say, you were silly and you made a mistake. So if you've got a partner who is actually understanding and prepared that you might try something and it won't always work out, but at least you tried and we can discuss it later. It's all of these things that help people with their bridge, I believe. So I guess that's about all I need to say or I'd like to say about training people in looking at what is a mistake 
and what is not in this enormous world of trying to learn bridge that we're all involved with. Hmm. That was, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, any uh, follow-up questions from uh, Graham Pearson or anyone joining us? Liz, thank you. Thank you for that nice comment. Yeah, I'm kind of disappointed, really, because I thought we'd had a good teacher scrap, but it looks like we, we all agree. <laughs> we're all agreeing. <laughs> yeah, this mistake thing is uh, it's just, uh, you know, overrated. Something Kirsten touched on earlier was the idea of playing to your potential, you know, and what we can do is we can improve our technical ability more and more and more and more and more, and we can keep working on improving that, but it doesn't matter how high we get our technical ability, we never, ever, ever play to that level. So there's two way, there's two things we can do. We can work really hard to improve our technical ability, or we can work to play closer to our potential. And it's a hell of a lot easier to play closer to potential just by you know, relaxing and, and, and having a tolerant partner and you know, smiling and looking around the room and, and uh, enjoying the game. <laughs> you play better that way. Don't worry about the mistakes. Yeah. Um, one thing I'd like to just mention that, um, that Graham sort of touched on, but when I was trying to learn, and I'm still trying to learn, um, if I would present my opinion to experts and I'd say, but... I think I should have done this on this hand. I would always find that they'd say to me, um, I wouldn't do that on the hand. And I couldn't ever understand why they said that. But as you um, sort of get better, supposedly, you realise that mostly they do know what they're talking about. So I actually think that we can all learn quite a lot from people who are more experienced than we are. And I think the best thing is to just sit back and try not to give your point of view, just say, what would you do on this hand? And not say, oh, I thought I did this. I thought that was right. Well, it's usually not. So I've learned to just be quiet and listen to people who actually have played a lot more than I have, even though I've played a lot of bridge. I think that there's always a level you can aspire to, and the best thing is just to listen. So, <laughs> I, I want to uh, thank all three of you for um, so many helpful tips, things that I'll keep thinking about for a while. Uh, for everyone who left comments, left questions, thank you so much. Um, I will post a replay video of this shortly, and I'll send out an email so that anyone can rewatch it. And why don't we keep the conversation going there? So. Um, if uh, before uh, we just say goodbye, I just want to ask quickly, uh, Joan, Kirsten, Graham, what's coming up for you? Is there anything that uh, we can let the people watching this know uh, where to find you next? Any interesting projects or books or classes? Um, well, I, I believe that in this day and age, we've got to make things very short modern and I've redone my beginners lessons and some videos on my website uh, to make them very straightforward, very simple, very short videos, very much different to what we used to do in the past because we're all pretty busy people these days. So yeah. Oh, so go check that out. JoanButtsBridge.com, correct? Yes, thanks. All right, make sure everyone uh, go go check that out. Kirsten, Graham, anything uh, you can share with Folks who'd like yes. to learn more from you? Uh, well, as, as Joan says, we are um, living in very strange times at the moment. So um, uh, I'm working on some online stuff. I think online is definitely going to be playing much more of a part in all of our lives over the next little while. And um, that's where my efforts are being concentrated at the moment as well. So, Fantastic. Well, please uh, keep sharing updates with us and we'll pass them along to everyone uh, who we have coming to LBO. Graham? Thanks. Yes, it's, a, it's an online world at the moment, isn't it? We're all 
we'll all have to. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I've been doing some teaching on LBO, so you can find some more information about that on Wednesday nights. Uh, come along and join me on Sundays for the live stream at Sky Bridge Club as well. I play 10 hands and just talk through as I'm playing. And, and just like this, we can we can talk about the hands and then you can play the hands as yourself, play the hands as yourself. So either way, we'll see you around. We'll, we'll find you all online somewhere. <laughs> Oh, thank you guys. Uh, thank you again to everyone who came, who left questions and comments. And yeah, especially with um, the current events being what they are, it feels really special to connect with so many people from around the world in this way. So it really means a lot that you guys came. To our and panelists, thank you guys so much. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you. Cheers.